Good morning, everyone, and welcome to San Antonio. Thank you, Diana, for the kind introduction and uh, for the WAMD Organizing Committee for giving me this opportunity to address you this morning. Uh, okay. To figure out a little bit of logistics here. All right, good. Um, so I'm going to spend the next uh, 50 minutes or so uh, talking to you about photon dose algorithms in the IMRT era. And um, as, uh, in terms of an outline, we'll look a little bit at uh, uh, some introductory uh, comments on the basic physics of uh, photon beams, review uh, classical dose calculation algorithms so we can put them into uh, perspective, and then uh, put a little bit more emphasis on the convolution superposition uh, model, which is the most commonly used one in uh, modern treatment planning systems, and also talk about uh, the, the Monte Carlo algorithm as well. And then we'll have some concluding remarks. So what are the attributes of uh, a good dose calculation algorithm? Uh, it needs to be based on uh, first principles, on, on, on physics. Uh, it needs to be accurate, and uh, the accuracy is typically measured against uh, 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 measurements that we obtain in uh, stylized phantoms, uh, water or inhomogeneous uh, phantoms. It needs to be uh, fast because we, uh, we have to work with uh, the physicians uh, and our colleagues that are expected the plans to be done quickly, as you know, so we cannot take uh, too long to produce uh, a plan. So speed is, uh, is important. And it also needs to be expandable. So once we come up with an algorithm, we need uh, to make sure that it is based on first principles of, of physics, as we said before, but also if we add a new modality, such as we have seen the IMRT or VMAR or whatever else comes up uh, in the future in terms of uh, means of delivering the radiation, to be able to use the same algorithm uh, in, um, in calculating the dose. Why is it important to have accurate dose calculation algorithms? Uh, that is because the effectiveness of the radiation therapy, as you know, depends on maximizing the tumor control probability and minimizing the normal tissue complication probability. So both of these quantities are very sensitive to, uh, to the absorbed dose, and we know from radiobiology that uh, a 5% change in dose can correspond to as much as 20 or 25% of change in tumor, uh, normal tissue complication probability. So it's very important for the dose to be accurately delivered so we can make uh, uh, predictions uh, through the clinical trials and control studies that we do on, uh, on the outcomes we're going to have and have meaningful reporting data. So when we look at um, where the photons are coming from, uh, as you know, uh, we, we have uh, electrons uh, as being the primary source of radiation, and those can be converted through to, uh, to photons. But as you see at least at this little schematic that, uh, that we have on the screen, the photons come out uh, of, the, uh, of the source after the electrons interact with the target, and uh, they diverge uh, going downwards. Then we have the flattening filter, and we have the collimating devices that further collimate the beam to its final shape. So the primary beam interacts with a lot of uh, uh, aperture modifiers uh, on its way down to uh, the patient. And uh, consequently, we have, at the end of the day, a, a mixture of primary photons, scatter photons, and scatter electrons that come from the head of the machine that we have to account for when we calculate the dose. One thing to remember as we look at this um, diagram is that uh, in the megavoltage energy range that we're interested in in radiation therapy, the dominant effect in terms of uh, the interaction of photons with matter is that of, of Compton. And when we look at this uh, table here that shows for different uh, energies from 1.25 cobalt equivalent up to uh, 6 MeV of uh, single energy photon beams and, uh, and look for three different media, the amount of energy that is transferred uh, to electrons, we can see that the electrons can, uh, that are at the end of the day, responsible for depositing the dose, they can travel a fair distance in, uh, in both uh, muscle and, uh, and lung as well as, uh, as bone. So if you look at the 6 MeV, for example, photons, the, the electrons that they produce can travel almost 7.5 centimeters in lung. 
So they can transfer energy from the point that it was released a fair amount away from, uh, from that point. That's why it is important for the algorithm that we use to compute the dose to be, uh, to be accurate, so it can reflect that redistribution of, of uh, energy through the scatter component. This is here another slide that shows, uh, as a function of depth, uh, field size, and energy, how what percent of, uh, of the dose uh, that is deposited to the central axis uh, comes from the scatter. So what we can see here is uh, that uh, as the depth increases, the percent of the scatter increases. As the field size increases, the percent of the scatter also increases. And as the energy increases, the percent of the scatter contribution decreases. These are things that we all know, but we just uh, put them here in, uh, uh, in emphasis so we can appreciate the contribution of the scatter to the dose and why it is important to model that correctly. This is another table here that shows the different sources of uh, errors uh, uh, in, uh, in the context of, uh, of radiation therapy delivery. And um, if we focus down on the, uh, on the last line that corresponds to the dose calculation, recognize that there are many other uncertainties that contribute to the bottom line, we we'll see that to achieve in less than 5% overall accuracy of, uh, of delivery, we have to have a dose calculation algorithm that is better than 2% accurate. And if we look further to the right column that says what we'd like to have in the future, if, uh, if we hope to be able to deliver radiation with less than 3% error, then the corresponding accuracy that we have to have in those calculation is uh, 1%. So we need to strive to come up with as, as good of a dose calculation algorithm as we can. And to that effect, we actually have two different categories that we can, uh, that we can bundle the algorithms that we have to compute dose for, for photon beams. The first one being the measurement-based algorithms, and the second one is the model-based algorithms. For the measurement-based algorithms, uh, we rely on measured data in the water that, uh, that we measure at the time that we commission a new accelerator. And we use empirical functions and, uh, and, uh, uh, and tables that we create to compute uh, the dose at the time of, uh, of the treatment plan. So these are the techniques such as the Clarkson or ETAR uh, algorithms that, uh, that you've known and that we've used uh, extensively in the past. And the model-based algorithms are those that we use measured data to derive the model parameters that drive the dose calculation. And once initialized, the model uh, can accurately predict the dose uh, based on physical uh, laws of radiation transport, such as those used in the convolutions proposition in Monte Carlo techniques. So no measured data is directly used in the calculation in, um, in the latter category of model-based algorithms. Historically, we've seen uh, the uh, ratio of TRs, BATHO, ETAR methods, the fast Fourier transform, uh, differential SAR, delta volume, and the convolutions proposition or dose spread array methods and, and Monte Carlo. The O'Connor scaling theorem is the one that, uh, that is used pretty much in, in all the algorithms that we have used uh, historically and currently when we calculate the dose in the treatment planning system. And that, that basically states, as you can see from the cartoon that we have on uh, the screen, that the dose to, uh, to a point is the same in two different uh, media uh, as long as the composition, the atomic composition of, uh, of the two phantoms is the same if the density is different if you scale all dimensions by the inverse of the density. So if we double the depth and double the field size, assuming both, both of those phantoms have the same composition by different density, uh, different by two, then the, the dose to point A and B will be exactly the same. So this is the, this is the basis of what uh, of what we do in, in modern treatment planning using this scaling theorem. And we'll see how that plays uh, in, uh, in a few minutes. When we talk about dose calculation algorithms and inhomogeneity correction methods, we're talking in essence about the same thing because the, the human anatomy does have inhomogeneities and that, uh, that's the principal complication that we have when we calculate the dose, addressing the inhomogeneities correctly and secondary to that or lateral to that address the propagation of the scatter as we said earlier, that is uh, significant to be able to track that correctly. But most importantly, in areas of inhomogeneity, where the electro-influence and the photo-influence get uh, perturbed by the presence of the inhomogeneity. 
So when we look uh, again at the homogeneity correction methods, we have uh, two different kinds, ones that depend on a correction factor, which is the dose to the medium divided by the dose to the same point if the whole um, medium was made of water, and those that directly calculate the dose to a point, and that's because the inhomogeneity correction is inherent to the algorithm. Effective path length is one of the early methods that was used in addressing the effect of inhomogeneities. It models the primary dose variation. Uh, however, it's unreliable for regions of electronic disequilibrium where you have a changes of, uh, of density and or atomic composition and the electron spectrum changes as it tra traverses from one medium to another. And it, it usually gives decent results when the calculation point is far away from the inhomogeneity. Because of its simplicity and speed, the effective path length techniques, which we'll see uh, in the forthcoming slides, have often been used in MRT implementations, and they're still used uh, as such. So the ratio of TAR, so RTAR, is a correction factor-based algorithm. Uh, you can see here the equation is the ratio of TARs on the screen. Uh, it's an effective path length method, and um, it does a, a pretty decent job in addressing the effect of uh, inhomogeneity as we noted, further away from uh, the inhomogeneity pocket. The power uh, law or, or BATHO technique was originally introduced as an empirical correction to account for both the primary and, uh, and the scattered changes. And, um, and it was very successful. It was generalized by several investigators uh, to, um, uh, to be applicable when we have, uh, when we have the the primary beam traversing multiple pockets of uh, inhomogeneities. And uh, for this calculation, the position of the homogeneity is considered in the calculation contrary to the ratio of uh, the TARs. So this, uh, as we said, is a, is a popular uh, method that has been used historically in planning systems. Uh, it has also seen, um, uh, it has also been used in IMRT implementations by several planning systems when the IMRT first came out. It works well below a large inhomogeneous layer of uh, electron density less than that of uh, tissue, so lung, for example. But if the electron density is greater than, uh, than water, the method tends to overestimate the dose. If one uses TPRs instead of a TRs, it uh, tends to, to predict the dose a little bit better but it also assumes that electronic equilibrium exists throughout the medium, and that is one of the weaknesses for those measured data-based algorithms that produce correction factors. The equivalent TAR was the first method that was introduced uh, specifically to take advantage of uh, the computers of, of that era, and also the fact that the com computer tomography was available, and one could uh, uh, segment the organs at risk and the target in, uh, in a true 3D uh, CT data set, and consequently should be able to produce a dose calculation that will be more accurate. So we found widespread use in uh, the planning system, uh, the treatment planning systems about uh, 20 uh, or so years ago, and several investigators generalized the method to improve its accuracy, application, and speed. There were a few other methods that uh, that came about uh, as an augmentation of what we knew up to that point, uh, that is the, the BATHO method, the ETAR method, and um, it was the fast Fourier transform convolution, the differential scatter ratio, and the delta volume. All three, however, of those uh, methods, um, although they, they did try to improve the uh, inclusion of more uh, accurate physics, representation of primarily of the, of the scatter component into the calculation, they were cumbersome, and uh, then they never found a, a widespread implementation, neither for the 3D uh, conformal radiation therapy planning era, nor for the IMRT era. Which brings us to the non-model-based uh, dose algorithms uh, uh, summary. The early algorithms were, for the most part, uh, correction-based methods, like the effective path length uh, notion, as we said already, assumed charged particle electronic uh, equilibrium conditions, and they were developed in the cobalt era, meaning uh, the photon energies in the 1.25 uh, 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 MeV. That's why the TAR implementation was, uh, uh, was so uh, popular. 
Although they evolved to include 3D scatter integration, just like the ATAR, as we said, they were cumbersome to implement and continue to suffer accuracy to the level that we wanted it to be for, um, for a, a more complex applications such as, such as the IMRT. So we have to adapt to the needs of radiotherapy treatment planning, and uh, that's how we came up with a new generation of algorithms that are the model-based algorithms. The Monte Carlo method is considered uh, by all of us the, the gold standard when it comes to dose calculation. It, um, it's a technique where we simulate uh, a very large number of histories of uh, the primary beam, in our case, uh, uh, photons, that, uh, that follow random tra trajectories, and the computer uh, uses those, uh, those random numbers to sample the, the probability distribution that governs the physical effects, the probability of interaction that is in, in a medium of uh, any arbitrary atomic composition and density, and uh, any geometry that is well-defined in the, in the code. So it is, it is a, a fairly complex uh, algorithm, but one that we understand very well, and one that comes in many different flavors nowadays, as we'll see here in, uh, in a few minutes. But, um, but it is the gold standard, because um, by simulating the large number of histories, uh, we, can, we can come up with uh, very uh, precise values Albeit they're still average, uh, but uh, very, very, very small error bar uh, values of uh, microscopic quantities, such as the ener energy deposition, which in essence, as you know, if you divide by the, uh, by the mass, is the dose, which is what we're interested in. The Monte Carlo codes are built on the foundation of uh, measured data and calculated probability distributions. And because those change over time, because of our ability to measure more accurately uh, with, uh, with new techniques and instrumentation, then those, uh, uh, those databases are get periodically updated and uh, consequently they improve the, the accuracy of, of the Monte Carlo codes that we have. Monte Carlo is often used to extract dosimetric information when physical measurements are difficult or impossible to perform. So when, uh, when in, uh, in radiation physics we want to calculate the dose, for example, in, um, uh, in a phantom or to characterize the response of an ion chamber for, uh, for measurements, then we can do that with Monte Carlo and uh, that way we can characterize specifically the properties of an ion chamber without having to use the chamber itself for the measurement. So it, it does serve as the ultimate uh, cavity theory and homogeneity uh, correction algorithm. Some of the advantages of the Monte Carlo is that the algorithms uh, are relatively simple. We call them complex before because of the physics that is behind them. But in reality, the idea of the algorithm is pretty straightforward. Uh, you take uh, uh, millions of photons and you force them to, to go through the uh, the head of the machine and uh, all the uh, aperture modulating devices that are thrown in, in the beam, and, um, and you track each of the particles until it dies, meaning until it, it leaves the, the, the space of interest or until it uh, transfers all its energy in the form of interactions with the matter. If, uh, if the sampling algorithm that we use in the Monte Carlo is reliable, the accuracy of the computation uh, that, is, uh, that is obtained is determined by the accuracy of the data that we use to feed the, the cross-sectional database of the algorithm. And that, as we said before, is, is very high because we have very precise data nowadays that we can uh, integrate with the Monte Carlo, with the Monte Carlo algorithms. <laughs> Some of the uh, presumed disadvantages of the Monte Carlo is that it used to be that it uh, consumed great amount of computing resources and it was not feasible for routine use. But um, as you probably already know and you'll find more about uh, uh, during this meeting from the exhibitors, there are now commercially available Monte Carlo solutions simply because the computing resources have uh, are come out uh, much faster nowadays, the computers are, and much cheaper. So we're able to, with, through parallel computing and, uh, and intelligent uh, computing, we're able to uh, implement the Monte Carlo in, uh, in today's computing uh, uh, resources that we have. Electron and photon Monte Carlo uh, still relies on condensed history algorithms 
that do have some assumptions. And although we won't talk much about those, the, the, the fact is that uh, you can make a Monte Carlo algorithm that is uh, in principle very precise. You can make it uh, a little weaker in its uh, accuracy by making some assumptions on the fate of the particles that you transport. And um, you do that to make them run faster. So the speed and the accuracy tend to compete a little bit. There are many different flavors, as we said before, in uh, Monte Carlo algorithms. We have uh, some acronyms listed here, EGS4, MMC, VMC, MC, and P, Penelope, Peregrine, but they all, at the end of the day, have the same uh, goal to fulfill. They want to accurately model the radiation transport through any geometry that, uh, that we give to them, uh, which includes, in our case, the linear accelerator and the patient uh, itself and do it as fast as possible with as few assumptions and compromises to the physics of radiation transport. So again, we can maintain the, the accuracy at, at least to the extent to the, that is clinically uh, relevant. Here is something that uh, uh, we'll see here in the next uh, four slides that shows the noise uh, on the treatment plan that you can see from a Monte Carlo. So this here is a noise-free Monte Carlo algorithm that runs many millions of histories. This is how it looks at a noise level of 1%, of 2%, and of 4%. See, it becomes a lot more noisy, as we noted before, uh, the number of histories that we run, which uh, indicates how long the algorithm is going to run, produce different amount of, uh, of noise. A tip typical is a uh, 2%. So typically when you see Monte Carlo plants, uh, they have an inherent noise of about 2%. You may not see it. It might be hidden in, uh, in the algorithm the way that Nash distributions are uh, projected. But typically, the 2% the is considered to be um, a good acceptable noise level for a Monte Carlo algorithm. This would be if he had a 16% noise, which you can see that you really cannot tell too much. So it's a Monte Carlo, but it, not one that uh, that be of, uh, of clinical uh, use. And that brings us to our, our second uh, class of algorithms uh, that are model-based, the one that is uh, most popular nowadays. It's the convolution superposition. We'll spend a few minutes uh, going through this one simply because it is the, the heart of most of uh, those algorithms in the most popular planning systems that we have out there. Uh, namely, the, uh, these slides that I'll show to you is from our experience with, uh, with Pinnacle, but uh, Eclipse has uh, something very similar uh, for, the, for the AAA, at least, uh, algorithm, as well as uh, uh, Oncentra and Tomotherapy and Ray Search. Anybody that has a convolution proposition is something like that. So this is the... Uh, I'll, uh, the integral that, uh, that uh, mathematically shows the expression for cal calculating the, the dose in the convolution superposition algorithm. And um, we can recognize three elements here. It says that the dose is the integral, which is the sum, in essence, of the mass attenuation coefficient times the primary photon fluence times a convolution kernel. And schematically, you can see what happens at the bottom. Uh, the, the, first, uh, the first term, which is the mass donation coefficient times the primary fluence, is what is called the terma, the total energy release per unit mass. And you can, you can see that this is monotonically decreasing as you go from the surface down to depth. So as you, accept, you ex expect, you have the exponential attenuation of the primary photon beam as it traverses through, through matter. So it's monotonically uh, decreasing. And we convolve that with a kernel uh, that is the descriptor of the scatter. So the, the kernel tells us how the scatter is going to be distributed from an interaction point and blur the dose. So the convolution of those two gives us what you are familiar with on the far right, which is a dose distribution from a single beam that, uh, that interacts with uh, a, a square-looking homogeneous water phantom. So the first term, as we said, in that, uh, in that integral is the terma, is the total energy release per a unit mass, and is the product of uh, mass donation coefficient and the energy uh, fluence. It tells us how much energy is available to us to consume that was released to consume at any point along the depth of the beam. So to calculate the, the dose at a point, what the treatment planning system does is we have, we have the source over here, and it shoots those uh, photons 
in a divergent geometry down towards the phantom. And this little uh, ellipsoid here is meant to represent uh, the patient. And when we have a photon interacting at a point in uh, the phantom, then we're going to have some energy that is released over here. And our question is how much energy is deposited to this point down here. So the energy to this point down here will be the summation of all the contributions from all the voxels, all the primary interaction sites throughout the phantom. That energy is released, and a percent of that energy finds its way down to the dose deposition site. And that's what the convolution uh, code does. It, uh, it sums together all those, um, uh, all those contributions from every primary interaction point throughout the phantom. So when we look at it in more practical terms in the planning system as to what happens, you have the city data that you bring into the planning system. And then there is a city to density table that you have also selected as part of your uh, planning process. And what will that do is it will take, it will take um, for every pixel that you have in the city data set, it will find the corresponding uh, density through this table. So in essence, you've taken this volume that has city numbers that you pulled in, and you've converted it to a, a three-dimensional volume of densities. And there is also, in the physics environment of the planning system, a, a table that has the mu over or the mass donation coefficient as a function of, uh, of energy. And that is also mapped back to the city volume. So, so every, for every voxel that you have in this three-dimensional volume of the CT, you now have a, a corresponding density. And via the density vehicle, you can have a corresponding mu over O. So it's like having a three. 3D volumes, one with the CT uh, numbers, one with uh, the density numbers, and one with the mu over row numbers. So it's a, it's a mapping process that, that you engage anytime you select a CT to density table when you import a, a fresh CT in your planning system. And then in the physics environment, again, your medical physicist has, uh, has already characterized your, um, the shape of your, uh, of your primary beam as part of the, the modeling process of the convolution superposition uh, algorithm. And we have, we have given the shape of uh, the energy fluence of the photon beam as it comes out of the linear accelerator as a function of a field size. So all the treatment planning system is going to do is going to take that shape and it's going to ray trace, it's going to propagate it through the volume of the patient. We noted in the beginning that you have the primary beam, which was the one that we saw here in the, uh, in the previous slide. This is the primary beam, the shape of the primary beam. He has the letter M almost to account for the attenuation through the flattening filter. But we also said that we have a scatter uh, component that comes from the interaction of the primary beam with uh, the flattening filter, the ionization chambers, the drawers, etc. So this is accounted for in the convolution superposition model using a, a broad a Gaussian uh, um, filter as the one you can see over here. And when the planning system looks at the dose at the, at the point that you want to calculate it, it, it looks up and it sees how much of this broad Gaussian filter is integrated, is contributing, how much of that scatter is contributing to the dose that this point can see. And that's an additive component to the dose that it will calculate from the primary uh, ray trace. So this is here diagrammatically what's happening. Again, you have the source. You have here the incident uh, fluence, the one that is characterized in the, um, in the physics environment of your planning system. And the photons get ray traced, get uh, propagated through this divergent anatomy through the patient. They interact at different points. They release energy. That energy is distributed in 3D using the, uh, using the kernel. So this is the kernel over here. The kernel uh, is a computer using uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, the Monte Carlo algorithm is used to show the distribution of scatter from, uh, uh, from uh, photons of different energy in, uh, in water. And then the shape of the kernel is ultimately one that looks like a water drop, like the one that you see here on, uh, on the slide. So these, uh, these are, in essence, isodose lines normalized to the center of the kernel. So anytime you push the, the compute button in your treatment planning system, what it does is it will take this primary photon beam, as we showed it before, it will push it through the patient's anatomy, it will do the primary attenuation, like e to the minus mu x, 
It will calculate how much energy is released at each point. That was the term that we defined before. And then it will go and it will convolve, it will multiply the energy that is released at each point with this kernel. So it will tell you how far away and in what direction the energy is going to be deposited from this primary interaction side. And at the end, the algorithm will go and sum all those energy release uh, processes together to calculate at its voxel how much energy has been deposited from all those primary interactions. Um, did I push that? Okay. The, schematically, then here, this is what, uh, what happens, what I just described uh, in the words. You have the photons coming in uh, from the source. They're going through this uh, stylized uh, lung patient that we see over here. These will be primary photons. They will interact at some point, and as they interact, they're going to release energy, and the energy is going to be distributed in three dimensions following the shape of the convolution kernel. This is what we talked about so far, so this is what we see here schematically. What we do recognize here, however, is that uh, we do have an inhomogeneity, which is uh, the, the lung on the left and the right lung, uh, and um, and naturally, we, we wonder if the distribution of the scatter is going to be as shown over here with a kernel. And it won't be. The reason it won't be is because as the kernel crosses from water to lung, which is a much less density, about a quarter of the density of, uh, of water, then the scatter is going to have less resistance, if you want to call it that, less attenuation, so the scatter is going to travel further away compared to what it would have been if it, the patient was made entirely out of water. And those kernels, as a reminder, were calculated specifically for water of density one. So what the planning system will do is we'll take those kernels, the kernel lines, the ISO dose effectively lines that are inside the line, and it will stretch them out. And it will stretch them out following the theorem they introduced earlier, which was O'Connor's theorem. So we'll use O'Connor's scaling theorem, and it will scale the density, will scale the dimensions here of the scatter, the distances, by the inverse of, uh, of the density. And consequently, we're going to allow for the, for the scatter to be distributed further away into the lung. So this is what the planning system does when it encounters a, a heterogeneity. If this pocket was made of, uh, uh, of a density that is less than, uh, higher than one bone, for example, then the opposite would have happened. The kernel is sort of stretching out, it would be compacted. Again, following that one over density scaling that, that we noted from O'Connor's theorem. And to look at that in, um, in more clinical uh, terms, this is how the dose will look if uh, in, a, in, a, in a single beam using the convolution superposition uh, method. You can see here that you have some dose that's leaking out of the edge of the field. That's indicative of the fact that the scatter is coming out of the field. The kernel is scaled, as we showed in the previous slide. And correspondingly, you can see here the green line that is shrinking, because if the energy went out, that means there is a deficit of energy inside the field. So for the energy to be conserved, you have to have this green as dose line kind of pulling in. If, uh, if you were to calculate the same distribution using more like an ETAR, like a classic older uh, type of equivalent uh, uh, method, then uh, it will look something like this. You would not see this spreading of the dose outside the field, neither on the um, neither on uh, on this side nor on the distal end of the uh, of the contralateral uh, edge of the field, but the azimuth lines would be nice and straight. But still, inside the field, you would see the the deeper penetration of the green azimuth line on the patient's right side because it goes through the lung, whereas here it goes through the mediastinum, which is almost density of one. So you account for something, but no, you don't account fully as you did over here. And of course, the worst case scenario is that you don't account for anything, and you have the beam uh, showing an acidosis distribution as if the patient was entirely made of water, and the only thing you account for, in fact, here is the, the surface inhomogeneity that you have up here on, uh, uh, on the interior aspect of the patient. So this is a, a, a telling uh, uh, slide with uh, the three pictures that shows how the convolution superposition method um, uh, differs from, from the old equivalent uh, ETAR, battle type of techniques, and from a homogeneous, homogeneous uh, dose calculation. 
Let's look at some different flavors here of the Monte Carlo and convolution projection algorithms. The first one is the finite size uh, pencil beam, also called FSPB, or more, more commonly PB for, for pencil beam. Uh, this model was first introduced uh, back in uh, 1992, and um, in essence, it's a reduction of the convolution superposition method, uh, where instead of looking at the 3D distribution of the scatter, as we depicted it with uh, the kernels, you're looking at all the scatter being uh, compressed into a pencil. Uh, so it has a, it's more like a one dimensional. So all the scatter is collapsed in one dimension. So you do account for something, in essence the effective path length, but uh, you cannot account uh, correctly for the lateral distribution of the scatter. The advantage of those uh, pencil-based uh, type of uh, algorithms is that uh, our um, they do have a, a modeling component. You can say they were derived from, uh, from a model style algorithm that is reduced in, uh, in one dimension primarily to accelerate the calculation for it to be done fast. So they, they found a very widespread use in the early versions of IMRT such as the one in the Corbus and CAD plan from, uh, from Varian um, and many others because they were fast, and as you know, we have a lot of parameters that we need to optimize, and we need to do that many times through iterative processes for the IMRT, so a fast algorithm that is, that is decent um, is, uh, is critical. So, uh, as, we, as we said, the short computation times was uh, one of its advantages, but, but uh, the dose accuracy breaks down at interfaces and for structures more than that of the pencil beam, and the lateral scatter is not uh, accurately uh, uh, modeled. This is here a, uh, a uh, figure from uh, papers from, from Jones showing that in a stylized phantom of water, lung, and water, uh, that uh, the difference between the Monte Carlo calculation, which is the one, the solid line, a convolution superposition, and that of a pencil beam is pretty uh, dramatic, it's pretty significant. <laughs> as a function of the aperture of the beam, three centimeters, one centimeter, and 0.5 centimeter. So the, the, the pencil beams are all the way up here, showing that um, they almost do not account for the presence of the line heterogeneity, whereas the convolution and the Monte Carlo are doing a, a pretty good job in accounting for the heterogene heterogeneity pocket that we have in this uh, simulation. Another algorithm, um, that uh, that's worth talking about uh, that that stems out of this uh, model-based uh, uh, class is the analytical and isotropic algorithm or AAA that has been uh, implemented and still is uh, an option for uh, the eclipse planning system. It um, uh, the AAA dose calculation model is a 3D uh, pencil beam convolution proposition style, and um, it has. Modeling for the primary photons, for the scatter, for the scatter uh, extra focal radiation, and for the contamination electrons. So it follows pretty much the same uh, the same flow as the one that we showed earlier, uh, as we explained the convolution superposition. It uh, it also has uh, data that come uh, from Monte Carlo, uh, such as. Uh, the ones that we spoke before about the convolution superposition. However, the, the tissue heterogeneity, heterogeneities, although they are accounted for anisotropically in, in three dimensions, uh, they're not done so uh, very accurately. The, the distribution of the scatter, there is a lateral distribution of the scatter, but it's limited only to four uh, directions. So in order to make the algorithm a little faster, uh, there was only four directions of the ray trace of the scatter, and, um, and uh, the, the modeling em employs a Gaussian functions for the, for, the, uh, for the source of the scatter, as opposed to the more uh, elaborate ones that came out of Monte Carlo that, uh, that we showed before. So it's definitely an improvement, a significant improvement over the pencil beam algorithms, but it's not as, as accurate as um, some others, namely this one over here, which is the linear Boltzmann transport equation solvers and um, we call those LBTE algorithms, but you probably know them more as the Varian Icarus uh, algorithm. This is the new algorithm that was introduced by Varian about um, uh, a year or so ago. The, uh, this class of algorithms is similar to those uh, used in, in Monte Carlo methods, and um, they aim to allow for accurate modeling of those 
uh, deposition in, uh, in, in any media, including heterogeneous media and media of varying density and atomic composition. So in essence, the LBT type uh, algorithms are, are Monte Carlo grade algorithms. They, they're subject to the, the same uh, uh, um, assumptions as well as uh, weaknesses as the, as the Monte Carlo. The potential inaccuracies that uh, depend on the level of sampling of the probability distribution functions that we use in Monte Carlo um, can affect the accuracy of, of the algorithm. Uh, but the LBT type of algorithms, the LBT solvers as we call them, are actually um, discrete algorithms. So, whereas the Monte Carlo, as we said before, simulates a large number of, uh, of, of particles and it takes a long time to calculate, this uh, accurate style algorithm is a discrete algorithm and it's analytical. So it's, it's like solving an equation. This, um, this is here a, um, uh, a figure in a couple of graphs I'll show you from a paper that, uh, that we published uh, recently that shows uh, two stylized phantoms. On the left you have a single beam thro going through a, uh, a pocket of uh, air, lung, or bone, so three different scenarios. And on the right side we have the same pocket but the beam is shifted to the, uh, the one side so it will be almost like a central axis of the beam going through uh, the pocket. And we'll do uh, depth doors and profiles across those two inhomogeneities. And here's the results that, uh, that you can see here on, um, on the graph. So on the far left, uh, we have the air, and then we have the lung, and then we have the bone. And what you see here is that the Monte Carlo and the, uh, and the convolution superposition and the Acuros, they all do an excellent job in uh, modeling the effect of uh, the, the air heterogeneity as you can see here, whereas the AAA uh, tries, but it doesn't do as good of a job. It does have a, a big difference between the three algorithms, uh, the three other algorithms. Um, if you look, however, in lung and in bone, uh, then, then you see that uh, it's doing pretty well. All the algorithms are, are, are pretty, pretty comparable. So in essence, the AAA is not as accurate as the convolutional proposition of the accuracy in air, but in lung and in bone, it's uh, the, the very, very comparable. And this is the same uh, for, the, for the profiles for the uh, beam uh, split right now. So you can see the inhomogeneities on the left side. Again, the odd bird out a little bit over here is the, the AAA, primarily in the, in the air inhomogeneity. But in go, when it comes down to lung, they look pretty comparable. In the bone, it looks like it's breaking down a little bit as well but overall is not terribly bad. So the take home message from this is that if your planning system has the accuracy of a convolution superposition, then you're doing better than uh, you, you'll be doing if you had the, the AAA, especially if you have any air pockets such as the, uh, the head and neck area of planning or any, any bone. This is also from uh, um, work that uh, we have done with um, uh, Prema, our graduate student, uh, uh, several years ago, she looked at um, the effective path left correction, the non homogeneity correction, and Monte Carlo type of algorithms uh, for uh, a stylized phantom and a, a tumor in, uh, in, inside the lung. And um, to, to no surprise, uh, we see here, as we know from many other publications, that, um, that the difference, uh, the, the effectiveness of the non homogeneity and the effective path length uh, is not as as, uh, as the same as the one for Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo is the gold standard, as we said before, and, uh, and uh, doing effective path length of non-homogeneity is not the, the better way to describe the, 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 the dose to, uh, to those lung uh, tumors. Uh, these here, um, I will pull them uh, up uh, all at the same time, and we'll go very quickly through them. These are here dose volume histograms for tumors, for lung tumors in different locations, as you can see here, from smaller to bigger, and in um, uh, different, different locations inside the lung. And you can see that depending on, on the size of the tumor and what it is in the lung, the dose volume histogram between the Monte Carlo calculation and non homogeneity and a modified path length calculation can be pretty similar or can be different 
to more different to significantly different. So the effect of the dose calculation algorithm can differ depending on the environment that the tumor is in and the size of the tumor. This is what we see from here. And before we conclude, I'd like to uh, spend a few minutes to talk about um, a, um, the effect of the dose calculation accuracy on MRT in, in terms of the, what is called the, the systematic error and the convergence error. This was a very nice paper that was published by Robert Gerard in 2002, but it's still very uh, relevant because uh, uh, almost nobody does this exactly right still. So the systematic error is the error that is inherent in the dose calculation algorithm, and that's what we've been talking about uh, so far, uh, how accurate is an algorithm, understanding that Monte Carlo is probably the best that we can do, and going backwards from there. So that's the systematic error. And the convergence error is the error due to algorithm error in determining optimal intensity. So that would be the error that we have if we use the wrong or not as very accurate of an algorithm as we iterate through the MRT process to find the optimal solution. And we'll see what that means here for in, uh, in a minute. Uh, this is again to, uh, to show you that um, in, uh, in a homogeneous water phantom, when you compare the Monte Carlo, the superposition, the pencil beam, to obtain the percentage dose or the profile, the, two, the, the three algorithms look uh, very much uh, the same because the conditions here are very, very homogeneous and the pencil beam does a very good job in predicting the dose as do the other two algorithms. However, if you throw an inhomogeneity, that of, uh, of a line as you can see here, then the convolution superposition and the Monte Carlo do an excellent job in predicting the dose along the depth, as well as the profile, which is broadened right now because of the lateral scatter. But the pencil beam does a very poor job in predicting both the, per the percent of dose as well as the, the profile uh, for that beam. So, here is what happens if you have a Monte Carlo-based calculation for this IMRT patient, for every iteration, because as you know, the IMRT uh, inherently has an iterative process, right? So you start with the intensity map, you do a calculation, you compare against your objectives, you fine tune the number of uh, beams or the shape of the beams that you compute again until you get a convergence. So here, oops, so here the, 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 the calculation at each iterative step was done with Monte Carlo, and the final dose calculation after the optimal, uh, the optimal control points were defined was done with Monte Carlo. That's why it says MC, MC. So everything is done with Monte Carlo, both each step and the final step. So the convergence error and the statistical error are minimized. Here we have the same uh, patient, and we have the calculation at each step is done with a convolution superposition, and the final dose calculation also done with convolution superposition. But the objectives, of course, are the same, so the, the, the optimizer drives and strives to give you the, 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 the same distribution uh, as much as you can to what you have up here. And for the very bottom, you have the pencil beam being what's used for each of the iterative step calculations as well as for the ultimate, for the final dose calculation. So again, the coverage here would be good because that's the only thing that the treatment planning system knows. However, if you take the, the solution for the superposition and you do the final calculation with Monte Carlo, then you see a distribution that is very similar, very slightly different from the gold standard, which is the Monte Carlo. But if you recalculate the pencil beam optimized treatment plan with the final dose calculation using the Monte Carlo, you see significant difference both in the coverage and the shape of the acid dose distributions between this and that. And that here again tells us that it is uh, sort of the significance of the convergence error, uh, as well as the uh, systematic error. So pencil beam is not a good uh, algorithm to use for, uh, for IMRT, especially in, um, in, in homogeneous tumors such as the ones in uh, the lung. This is again shown here uh, uh, using uh, uh, um, the dose volume histo histograms. And you can see here on the left how the deviates will look like 
if every respected algorithm has done both the iterative step calculation and the final calculation using the Monte Carlo convolutional position and pencil beam uh, respectively throughout the calculation. And here, of course, you see the difference when the final dose calculation is done with, uh, with Monte Carlo so you, can, uh, so you can see the distribution that you will actually receive if you were to deliver it. So the Monte Carlo and the convolutional position are very comparable, both in the organs at risk as well as the PTV, whereas the coverage for the tumor is very different uh, if you use the, uh, the pencil beam and compare that to the Monte Carlo. So in, in conclusion, um, the, the motivation for high dose accuracy stems from uh, steep dose response uh, of uh, dose response of tissue and um, narrow therapeutic uh, windows that we have to uh, observe and try to maximize. Early calculation models are based on broad beam data and assume transparticle equilibrium conditions that introduce calculation uh, errors and should be avoided. In homogeneity-based computations, alter both the relative dose distribution, as we showed, and the absolute dose to, uh, to the patient, namely the monitor units that the planning system will, uh, will calculate. State-of-the-art algorithms for photon dose computations should be used for both conventional and IMRT planning, because that way what you calculate is what you deliver, and you can have better outcome analysis and studies, especially for those that uh, contribute to um, uh, randomize uh, trials and national trials um, that uh, data, those data and distributions have to be reported. That way everybody <clears throat> uh, reports data that, um, that will be exactly what the patient received. Pencil beam algorithms can introduce significant systematic and convergence errors in uh, IMRT and should be avoided uh, when possible, although the magnitude of the deviation is plant-specific. As we briefly showed, it uh, depends, for example, for the lung, for the size and the location of, uh, of, of the tumor. And uh, in, in some occasions, the, the choice of the algorithm, even a poor choice of an algorithm, uh, would make an, uh, no much of a, of a clinical significance. Monte Carlo algorithms are now fast enough for clinical use but um, they don't always demonstrate a clear improvement over the convolution supervision implementation, and that is something that needs to be uh, uh, kept in mind. But they're definitely available now uh, for, um, from, uh, from Varian. In, uh, for electrons, they have a full Monte Carlo uh, uh, option, and for, um, for the photon planning, they have the Acuros system, which is, I would say, a, a, a more an analytical approach to, to Monte Carlo. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a very enjoyable meeting and stay here in San Antonio. We have, uh, we have a few minutes for questions, maybe a couple questions from the audience if you have any. Yes. I see one over there. One second. I'm sorry, I have the lights uh, in my face, so I really cannot see who's We're going to have microphone runners. Can you run over okay. to him um, now? Because I know people don't like to walk up to the microphones. Over here, I'll take it. <laughs> I see, see, she's there. So she we want everybody to be able to hear the questions. Oh, you have one. Uh, doctor, what are the ramifications of uh, not changing in Pinnacle from adaptive convolve to convolution convolve for the final plan? Uh, okay, so this is a pinnacle specific. Everybody heard the question. The microphone was on. I think I heard it pretty well. So uh, the pinnacle planning system has a, a couple of options to calculate the dose, and uh, one is the adaptive, and the other one is the, uh, the collapse cone convolution. There's, there's no difference uh, really between the two. The, in a nutshell, what happens is the, co the, the collapse cone convolution superposition um, uh, option will force the calculation, the ray trace of uh, the prime of the of the scatter uh, in the in the exact uh, grid that you have specified. Whereas the adaptive, it will do a smart search as it's looking around to dis to spread the scatter, and if it sees that between you and me, the medium is the same it's water, it's gonna take bigger steps. So it's gonna adapt because it sees there's nothing in between us that needs to spend too much time on. So it's gonna be a little bit more chunky. Uh, 
Uh, if he sees there's a lot of heterogeneity and change in the fluence between the two of us, then it's going to go in smaller steps to try to do a better job in spreading the scatter uh, correctly. So you can call it a smart collapse cone method that, uh, that interrogates the medium to see where we can go fast or we can go slow to correctly distribute uh, the scatter. But when it comes down to the monto unit calculation, the distribution of fast uh, lines, uh, they're, they're virtually identical at, uh, at the end of the day. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much again, and um, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Sorry. Yes, yes. Somebody said something? Yeah, here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, you mentioned on one part of your talk uh, about noise, that the, the noise amount is about 2%. What exactly, how you would you... Um, Account for that noise, and okay. do you want to see the noise, or how is um, a way to reduce it? That, 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 uh, a good question. Um, we we went through it relatively quickly, but the reason why we didn't dwell too much on it is because in um, in the in the in the photon in the in the commercially available photon algorithms, none of them has a full Monte Carlo except the Acuros, which is not, as we said, exactly Monte Carlo. It's a, it's a, it's a flavor of Monte Carlo that it's uh, analytical. So the, the Acuros does not have any noise in it because it's based on a, a functional calculation as opposed to a stochastic calculation. So you know, the convolution supervision has no noise. The Acuros has no noise. So what you see right now in your planning system, although there is an error bar associated with it, depending on assumptions that you made in the calculation, the dose grid, resolution that you used, uh, the number 